Hello and welcome to the Malaika Rights channel. My name is Malaika Rights and today I'm going to be talking about the archetype of the fallen woman. Some of you may have come across the phrase the fallen woman if you run in literary analysis um, circles, but what is, the fallen, what is the fallen woman and why is this even a concept? In order to understand the archetype of the fallen woman it is important to talk about why we even have such an archetype to begin with and the main reason we have this archetype is because of an ancient social contract that we have and that is if women could become worthy of sacrificing for then men would make themselves disposable to ensure the survival of the group this has been the social contract that we have um, lived by for centuries. Men are the physically uh, stronger ones, so they are the ones who have had to face um, the aggression of the outside world. So that aggression may come in the form of animals, it may come in the form of weather elements. If there's a fire, it's women and children first. On the Titanic, it was women and children getting the boats first. and poor Jack has to sink to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so that's the kind, that's the social contract. But in exchange for this sacrifice for men being disposable elements of, um, the, uh, of a society, women were supposed to also work as a teammate. So it's not just um, becoming this shining example of femininity, but they were supposed to do the other end because while men are out there facing the more malicious elements of nature women were supposed to be harnessing the power of the more um of of the better parts or the more beneficial parts of nature for example picking the right berries or learning about different roots um that could be used for food learning about um the environment really making sure that life is able to flourish within the protective circle or, uh, or borders that the masculine element of this partnership has set up. And that was the social, con um, social contract that we had. So we see the social contract pop up a lot in different works of fiction. We see it in a lot of the King Arthur legends. We see um, it in a lot of medieval works, this idea of courtly love, um, which was supposed to be a reenactment of this um, of this contract. So the whole concept of courtly love is that you have a woman who is um, physically very beautiful, inwardly as well. She's, she's a beautiful person, um, ladylike, essentially trying to be something of a goddess trying to be perfect essentially and the knight is supposed to perform all these deeds in her honor so that's the whole idea of courtly love it's a sort of reenactment of this social contract and that pops up a lot in a lot of medieval stories um especially with because that was the era in which courtly love was very big so now that i've sort of explained what the social contract is. I think you can begin to see where this archetype of the fallen woman comes in. Because the standard was so high, the standard was uh, very high during the Middle Ages, especially with the idea of courtly love. You had writers who started to kick back against that or writers who began to expose the darker side. The whole relationship between Guinevere and Lancelot in the Arthurian um, legends is sort of an expression of the failings of courtly love because they actually did end up falling in love with each other betraying King Arthur so when you have this concept of the fallen woman it's a lot to do with betrayal of this contract um, you begin to see this archetype really take form in in books that are a lot more modern for example George Eliot's Adam Beedy where the character of Hetty becomes a fallen woman when she has a child out of wedlock and subsequently this is a bit of a spoiler but she kills her child so that whole scenario 
embodies the archetype of the fallen woman. It's a woman who was physically perfect, interior, her interior may have been perfect, what may have been good enough because um, as we get towards more, as we move away from poetry and into more novels, we have less perfect characters because you're able to give them a lot more complexity and depth than you could in poetry. So as we're moving towards novels, as Adin Beedi is, Hetty is physically beautiful, but she inwardly, she's quite shallow and she relies on her beauty a lot. That's not necessarily the worst of things, especially for the time that she was living in. Her beauty would have gotten her um, a lot. That's what she was trying to use it for. She was trying to be hypergamous and marry somebody who was above her station so she could improve her life. So when you have a woman, who, and she starts at the beginning of the story as the, the valued one because of her physical beauty, but because she has a child out of wedlock, in essence, tainting herself, she falls from grace. So the um, archetype of the fallen woman is all about a fall from grace. One of the reasons why we even have the archetype of the fallen woman to begin with is because when you go against the contract, the social contract, which is women make yourself valuable to men or facilitate an environment that life can flourish while the men are making the sacrifice with their bodies and their very lives to protect the system in which you operate in. So when you go against that system, you essentially fall from grace and you also upset the rest of the system. So a lot of the times, um, it would be other women who would give you this title. Because if you are um, engaging in sexual activity outside of marriage, outside of um, a covenant or a, what is seen as the appropriate setting, then you would actually be in favour with the men because you would be giving them what they essentially want without any of the responsibility. But you also make it more difficult for the women to operate within the system and so they would be the ones who would criticise you, who would give you the title of the fallen woman. And in Adam Beedi what we see it's Dina who, um, or Dinah, makes Hetty confess what she has done and it's and Dinah is elevated because she, and they switch places so it goes from Dinah being the slightly more unattractive um, of the of the two and she's elevated at the end and she's the one that gets married whereas um, Hetty is unmarried and she has this stained reputation so for more about women and reputation I would advise that you watch my Beauty and the Beast uh, video and for more about what the ideal woman essentially is, um, I advise that you watch my my Galadriel and femininity video and also the Proverbs 31 um, video because those really do go into a lot more depth about um, ideal femininity and the feminine journey. So the last thing I want to talk about with this archetype of the fallen woman is the feminist reading of it. The feminist reading of this archetype is that women were oppressed by this system and therefore the fallen woman is actually a sort of victory over a system of oppression that had that made them have to suppress their sexuality in order to survive in a system that did not favour them. And while there is some truth to it, which is why it's um, it would be senseless to outright rule that reading out, but it doesn't take into account that the times in which this system was most prevalent were times that were difficult for everyone. You needed to have, it, it was less of an oppressive um, system and more of a system of collaboration. Wars were constantly happening and people were, people needed protection. There was no police force. There was no um, concept of, um, you having the safety to leave your house and just pop to the shops. We complain that now we don't have, that women especially don't have the liberty to go to the shop without fearing for their lives, but 
we are living in the safest time in human history, even with the, the skirmishes that are happening in other places. And I hate to use that word skirmishes because what's happening is very real to those people. But compared to what humans have experienced in the past, it's a skirmish. So when we're looking at text in the past, and when we're looking at systems that were prevalent in the past, they are not the systems we are living in right now. In the past, men needed to be courageous. You needed men who were willing to see their lives as disposable. You needed a system where men could be conscripted and would just go. So when you're living in that particular system, what is required from the other party, what's required from the other side of the society, which is women, is a cooperative effort to make themselves worthy of that sacrifice. It's what is behind has to be worth going ahead, essentially. If what is ahead of you is war, then what you are, what you have behind you, which is your family, has to be worth it. People needed to be willing to give up their lives for other people and those people who were left behind had to be willing to make the sacrifice worth it. We live in a society today where you are allowed to be more of an individual than you could ever be in history. So we live in a society where people have the choice, but that choice was hard won. And that's why the fallen woman, no matter what context you're trying to talk about it in, will never be a positive thing, given the context in which this idea of the fallen woman came to be. Because what that fallen woman represents is not an individual triumph against an oppressive system, but actually a threat to the system itself. When you look at the time period, she couldn't rely on the state to take care of her. Her life was essentially ruined if no one else would marry her, which was very unlikely. She faced a hard life of poverty. And and poverty that we don't really even see today in certain parts of the world. So when we talk about these concepts, it's very important to put them in their historical context and not to look at them in our very liberated society of today. So that's all I want to say about this archetype. I hope that you've gotten a better understanding of it and I hope that you have enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Malaika Rights channel.